Oh, hello. Many Magic the Gathering players ask the question, what is the future of professional Magic the Gathering play, of organized play? So I have brought here the one, the only, Paulo Vitor Damaderosa, all the way from Brazil. Well, he's still in Brazil, but we've phoned him up to talk about this very important subject. Paulo, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, hey, thank you for having me. Hello, everybody. For those who may not be familiar, Paulo is uh, one of the best, I'm going to say, Magic players uh, playing today. He was elected into the Magic the Gathering Hall of Fame in 2012, the first player from South America to uh, have that happen. 13 Pro Tour top eight finishes, two Pro Tour wins. Uh, he's the second for the most Pro Tour top eight finishes of all time in the history of the game, won the world championship for the 2019 season, and gotta say, uh, I believe he's the number one leader in terms of prize money from professional magic play at the professional level, youngest player to ever reach 300 lifetime pro points, an incredibly impressive resume that could go on and on, but we want to actually have a discussion here today. I can think of no one finer to discuss the future of professional play than the professional himself, Paulo. Yeah, no, it should be very interesting. Uh, it's it's something that everyone is a little bit confused about. I think we've had so many changes lately, right? But it should be an interesting topic to talk about. All right, well, let's just start with it. How do you as a professional Magic the Gathering player, view the current state of professional or organized Magic play? I think it's really a mix. Uh, I think some of the things are the best they've ever been, and some of the things are not so good. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's going to be the case with almost every system, right? Uh, but the, the biggest issue that we have right now is that things change too much. So I, I feel like we haven't had the same system be the, the organized play system uh, two years running in, in what's been, it's felt like 10 years, right? Since we've had the same system from one year to another, which makes it very hard to follow anything. It makes it very hard to plan for things, right? Because people who are interested in the organized system, uh, some of them, they, they want to make this their, their life, right? They're, they're living their livelihood. And if you don't know what's going to look like a year from now, because it's never been similar from one year to the other in the past 10 years, that's a really hard thing to do. It's really hard to commit when you don't know what you're committing to. Yeah, and I, I got to say, just as a spectator, I'm, I've am i never never pursued professional magic play myself, but I love watching it and following all of you, the titans of our game, play it out on the battlefield. And over these last two years, I don't know what's going on just as a viewer. It's I don't even know what to call some of the events. They've taken names and terminology that was so established, and now I don't know what to say. Like, is it the Players Tour? And what is that in relation to the Pro Tour used to be? And then they brought things back. And it, it's just very confusing for me as a spectator. So I can only imagine what it's like as someone trying to actually succeed within that system. No, it is very confusing. And, and some of the things I think are not their fault, right? For example, the, the pandemic, it made everything more confusing, right? right? Uh, and then right. Magic Arena, though, obviously they're involved in Magic Arena. Magic Arena happened very quickly. Right, so the whole system had to change to, to adopt Magic Arena, and they were on kind of like, uh, you know, unknown ground for Magic, I think, uh, with, with this whole online play thing. So they have been trying stuff out, and what works they keep, and what doesn't work they, they don't keep, and then that means that year after year the system keeps changing. Right, uh, but some of the things like just changing the names of the events, right, oh, we're going to pick Players Tour instead of Pro Tour. So it's a different event, but it's also the same initials. So it's really confusing. Right, right. Right. And it's like, oh, we want to preserve part of the history, but not preserve the history at all. And then we're also going to erase all of the DCI history and stuff like that. So I feel like that is kind of confusing. Like, are, are they trying to preserve the history or to just erase everything and start over? And if that's what they're doing, why is that? Right. So, yeah, yeah I think it's, it's, been, it's been a mix of things. <laughs> when was it then, I mean, you have a long history in the game playing at the professional level. If you had to pick a period when you think, out of all the periods you've played through, when you think organized play was just at its best, maybe it still had problems, but overall was was just the peak of uh, uh, organized play 
when do you think that is? And I'm speaking in terms of like the system. Like when do you think that it was uh, the most well-oiled machine or working to your liking the most? It's hard to say because I feel like every period has had elements that were very important. For example, right now, one of the things that is best about the system right now is that the amount of money is the largest by far. Mm -hmm. Right. So in in this system, uh, it is possible to make a living from magic, I think, uh, from just playing magic. Right. It is a thing that some people can do. And the number of people who can do it and who gets to do it is what the system is defining. And maybe it's not the best because of that, but it is possible. To, to, for someone to, you know, have a family and have a good living in a good place by being just a magic player. And I feel like in, in previous years, when the system was uh, better in some aspects, the amount of money was so much lower that it wasn't possible for anyone to, to have a family and have a good life by being just a magic player. Right. Right. So, so at that point, which system is better? Right. I, I, I feel like this system is better because it allows these things to exist, even though it's not as finely tuned as, as it could be, you know, even though it's confusing, even though it's not necessarily fair. Uh, at least it's possible for someone to have that. Uh, whereas in previous systems, it kind of wasn't possible for anyone. Mm -hmm. Right. But they, but they were better at identifying who deserved to get the things the most, I think. Yes. Right? They were more fair. Like if you were a good player, you, you got in. Right, and now it's not necessarily just about that. At least that's what I I look for in in an OP system, and maybe that is, uh, you know, my bias showing because I'm a good player, so I I, I want the things that benefit me, right? Of course, I, I I think spectators want that as well. We we players, I mean, we who just watch want our pros taken care of. We don't want you know, you being exploited, uh, uh, we're, we're your fans and we want to, the, the company that's making a lot of money off of you to treat you well for your time and effort and, uh, uh immeasurable skill or measurable skill, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> yeah. So I think the best system that we can have would probably be like the level system that we had before, you know, they were all pretty comparable. I think like level six, level eight, platinum, uh, the systems that we've had over the years, uh, I believe they were better from from an OP standpoint than the MPL is, but I believe the amount of money that exists now is much better than before. So if I could merge mm -hmm. the, the previous system with this amount of resources, that would be the best, I think. Right, right. Do you think that it's still possible in this current system for an average player to dream of of, of going pro and actually reaching those high echelons because as a spectator again the thing that i always found so tantalizing even though i personally didn't want to like go down and and top eight a gp all my friends did and when i was at the local game store and the gp was coming to town there was always this dream of maybe i can can make it as well and it seemed so much more obtainable in the old system do you feel that now uh it's just as obtainable for your just average new player getting interested in professional magic to climb the ranks and climb the ladder and stand shoulder to shoulder with 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 you folks or has that changed do you think i i definitely agree with you i think it's still obtainable but it's much 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 harder and i think harder than it should be Right, the, the previous systems, they were better in that regard because they made everyone start on equal footing every season, right? basically. Some people already qualified for everything, which made it obviously easier. But I felt like it was much much more possible, much more of an attainable dream to go uh, you know, start uh, nowhere, basically, and then end up in a very good spot. And I feel like right now, it's very, very hard. There, there are some stories like that, right? If you look at, you know, Chris Kvartek, for example. Chris Kvartek just started playing, did well in a bunch of events, and then just qualified for everything, and then now he's in the system, right? But it's very unlikely. I think in previous years, we'd have, you know, five or ten Chris Kvarteks, and now we just have Chris Kvartek. Right, right. All right, so, so it, is, it is definitely harder. But it's also, it's such a hard thing because uh, I think... When you, you have magic professionals, you, you tell these people, okay, you're going to dedicate your life to doing this, right? This is going to be your job. And magic is a job that offers almost no security, <laughs> right? And right. then, you know, magic is a game where, you know, even the best players have a 65% win rate. And depending on how you distribute this win rate, uh, like you, you could just not do well in any tournament with a 65% win rate, right? right? Or you could go 14 and 0 and then 0 14, and that's a 50% win rate, but it's really good. Right, so it's it's so hard to 
to just have any security in it because you don't know what's going to happen next year. Right? You, you take my career, for example. I was platinum or the highest uh, equivalent for like five years running. And then I was silver, which is like two steps below for two straight years. And I don't think much change in the way of my life or preparation. Right? It's just something that happens. And then you're asking these people to be professional players and but have no security of what their lives are going to look like next year. But how do you uh, attain this security while also making sure other people can get in? Right? I think that is the biggest challenge because the MPL gives you that security. Right? That is the, the, the great part about the MPL, I think, is that there is an amount of money. And then from one year to another, I know I'm not just going to be fired overnight. Right, which is what could happen in the previous system. It's it's not literally being fired, but for people who work with magic, it is literally being fired. Right, you you have this job for a year, and then next year you're just not qualified for the tournament. You're like, well, I don't have a job anymore. I have to to find something to do. And the MPL gave you that security at the expense on making it so much harder to let people win. And how do you balance the two? It's really hard. Do you think that you could ever envision? Uh, uh, a, a, a Magic the Gathering world where Wizards of the Coast has essentially abandoned organized play because a lot of us, and I, I've been called an alarmist, but it's because I care. <laughs> and when they started making these sweeping changes, I, as someone who loves pro play to watch, and, and I think it's just important to the game, even people who are just casuals who love Commander, I think it's all connected and it's so vital. I started freaking out and thinking, oh no, they're taking steps to de-emphasize and possibly phase down or or, or phase out you know, pro play as, as we know it, do you think that it's possible that we would ever, that, that they would ever go so far as to just abandon organized play? And, and what effect would that have on the game, do you think? I think it's really unlikely. Honestly, it, it, would, yeah. it would be so stupid for them to do that. <laughs> Uh, that I of course that I don't that doesn't but that's well, not stopped them from other things before but anyway go on well that, go that's on. fair but I think they recognize that I think the Pro Tour has a lot of value not it has a lot of value in so many ways right it has value because well there's the viewership and then but also there's the dream right there are the people who are just like following it and then there's all yeah there are all the events that feed into the Pro Tour right if you eliminate the Pro Tour you also eliminate PTQs and then you eliminate GPs mm-hmm. right because a lot of people go and play GPs right. because they want to get in this system, right? And then if people don't have PDQs to play anymore, suddenly they might not pay attention to what Dex been doing well in, in a tournament, right? Because who cares? And then right. the, the Magic websites start taking a hit too, right? Why, why are you going to read an article from a good player if you're just playing, if there's absolutely no, no perspective that you ever get anywhere, right? Without organized play. So I, I don't think they would just demolish this entire structure that has existed for, for such a long time. They might change it enough that it doesn't feel like organized play anymore because it's so different from what we had before. But I don't think they're going to do that because I, I think this past couple of years were an experiment. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the new changes that they announced it like a month ago. Yeah, I couldn't parse it. So <laughs> I, I literally, I read it and I got a headache. I had to work, I had to literally, uh, uh, I tried to do a video with the first batch of changes explaining them and I couldn't do it. I had to, to, to hire as a professional consultant, Emma Handy, to essentially <laughs> explain it to me and write out this script. And even then I, I started getting a migraine and then they changed it and I can't follow it. Can you follow? I mean, I hope you can follow it. Uh, it's very confusing. Well, the, the just of it was that in the previous year, the MPL had almost no churn, right? You you would mm-hmm. have, uh, you know, say the numbers might not be the exact, but you would have like 24 people in the MPL and the next year, uh, 20 of the people would remain and four new people would get in. And then Rivals was similar, okay. right? You'd have, you know, 48 people into Rivals and if 40 would remain, only eight people would get in. So whoever was on top just stayed on top. Uh, and I, this new system, it's kind of the opposite of that. Like, of the 24 people in the MPL, four are going to remain. And then uh, there's a potential for some more to, to remain through a gauntlet. But, uh, you know, the, the idea is to have a lot more churn than there was before. So they are, they are making it much easier for, for people who aren't in the system to get in the system, which I think is ultimately a good thing. Uh, you know, I might not agree with the numbers exactly, but I think the, the idea to make, to make the, it more accessible is there. So I think they did recognize that a big part of their strength is the fact that people participate in organized play, right? Because I think magic sets itself apart a little bit 
in, in the sense that Magic is a game for the players first and foremost, which isn't true with a lot of other games, right? I feel like League of Legends, for example, uh, it it's basically a split, right? It, it is a game for the players, but it's also a game for the viewers. Uh, and it that, that makes the whole dynamic different, right? They sacrifice a lot uh, in terms of game because they want it to be good for the viewers because that's their thing. And I don't think that's Magic's thing. I think Magic's thing is that people can play, people enjoy playing. There's so many different ways of playing Magic, right? You can play Commander, you can play just with, with your child, uh, or you can play FNM, or you can try to be a pro, uh, There's or you can play online or in person. There's just so many different ways of playing, and that is Magic's strength. And I think in the past couple of years, they kind of forgot that. They thought that ma- they wanted Magic to be about the viewers, and they sacrificed a lot in terms of it being about the players, one of the things being that they just wanted the MPL and they wanted the same faces in there to, for, for them to be more recognizable, right? But then they, they kind of killed the dream. They made it impossible for the players to, to have the chance to get there, right? But I think they realized after this year that this is not what they're supposed to do. And I think they're going to embrace the, the play aspect of Magic a, a little bit more from now on. At least that is the impression I have based on the direction the changes are going. Like, obviously, I don't actually know this Right? I know that people think that you know, oh, the pro players have those secret groups where they, they are told everything, and it's just... Uh, I don't actually know the direction the game is going, but I, I can you know, summarize that from the, what, what, the changes that have been happening. Yeah, I, I, I have enough, I have enough uh, uh, pro player friends and acquaintances to know that, that you folks are definitely uh, more in the dark than people uh, uh, assume in that regard. But, uh, uh, well, that, that certainly sounds positive. So if, I mean, I value, I really, as a content creator, I value organized play and the, the pro circuit and all of that stuff. I think that that's vital to my existence, even though I don't cover it at all. I think it's all connected. And I think that it all has to do with the larger magic ecosystem. I think it's personally one of the most important things is organized play, if not the most important. Uh, if, if you can't see a future where we would go to not having any pro play or organized play. What about this? Can you see a future where it's all digital and where wizards might abandon all paper professional play or organized play and we just shift to being digital only? And just in terms of the play, not in terms of like not still making paper cards, but where every everything that we compete in, what we that I as a spectator watch, that you as a professional play in, 100% we're going to shift over to digital. Do you think that's a possibility? I think it's possible. Uh, I think it's still unlikely, right? I wouldn't bet on it happening, mm-hmm. uh, but it's definitely more possible than the the other thing that that you asked. Like, uh, <laughs> sure. it's I, I don't think there's any chance they will ban organized play. Right? I also don't think there's any chance they stop making paper cards. But moving organized play specifically to digital, I think, is a possibility uh, because of just how much better it is to watch. Right? Even if you, mm-hmm. so, I, I'm a player that I prefer playing in person. Right? I don't love playing online. Uh, never have, right? I've I've always liked playing in person. I like the the feel of the cards, and I like you know the the social aspect of just being in a different country with my friends that I rarely get to see. Like that is important to me, and I also think I play better in person because online there's just you, you know there's stuff happening more around you. I feel it's harder to focus. Each person is different here, right? Some people prefer online. Some people prefer paper. I prefer paper, right? But I still think online is easier to follow. Uh, because the hands are all there and then the game does all the things for you. You know, there's no, like, there, there's a timer so you don't get this, oh, this person's been thinking for three minutes. Like, there are no judge calls, you know. So in that regard, if they value viewership a lot, then I believe that is something they could potentially do. What What is, what is just actually your opinion then of Magic Arena as a client, professionally speaking? Do you feel that it, it uh, is capable of, of meeting those demands? Do you think that it has uh, uh, issues that, like, is there things that need to be added in terms of the competitive uh, programming of the software or, or user presentation? What do you make of Arena? I think, it, again, it's really good in some things and really bad in others. Right. Uh, I believe right. it definitely has the potential to do everything we need it to do, right? I, I think if you just fix all the issues, then the, the skeleton is there, right? It just has so many mm-hmm. issues right now. Uh, and it, it that it's stuff that looks simple from my perspective, but I know zero of programming of any kind. 
So it could be this kind of stuff that is like, oh, actually, this is almost impossible to do, but it looks very easy from the outside. But it's like in, in the tournaments, we, we have had high level tournaments on Arena, right? And they have had their host of problems, right? We, we've had people who like, oh, disconnect for, you know, 10 seconds and then they lose the match right. because of that. Right. right? That's, that's not great. Right, you have oh. people who challenge each other in in different challenge settings, and then they just play the game in a different like with hand fixing algorithms where they shouldn't have, and all, all this kind of stuff. And you have like the client not passing priority when it should pass priority, or you have the auto tapper randomly tapping a, a bad land and stuff like that. So, but I think this is all it's all fixable, right? I, I imagine it's all fixable mm-hmm. um, if they just make it a priority. Uh, which I don't know if they have been making it a priority. So I think Arena is great. I, I like Arena more than Magic Online. Uh, I, I play almost exclusively Arena, uh, right? But mm. if, but some of the things in Arena just make no sense to me. For example, like the Amoncat board, right? Uh, the, this is right. A, a board that can happen when you play Amoncat Remastered or even when you play Historic. And then there are a lot of people who just get sick by watching it, right? right. That's just a thing that happens. And you're like, well, how does how does this get to happen? Right, and why wasn't it fixed yet? I don't know. I don't know how long it takes. I don't know, you know. And so it's the kind of thing that it, it looks fixable to me. Just remove the board or change the board, right? But yeah. it hasn't been fixed yet. So is it because it's actually harder to fix than I think, or because they're not making it a priority? I don't know. Right. I'm. I'm really surprised that not to go off off subject, but I'm really surprised that they haven't just made it so that we can each buy the type of board we prefer to see and then have that be the the default board that we see as we play. So that if I like this board, I can spend some gems and get that just like we get sleeves and and have that that board be what I see as I play. Uh, uh, Considering how much they like monetizing those features, it's surprising to me. Maybe it's a program issue. Maybe it's a program issue. Yeah, like for example, the the dog, right? There is a dog that is a pet. Uh, And it makes a noise that is very annoying to me. And I don't know if there's even a way to turn it off. And sometimes I'm playing right. in a tournament and then there's this dog barking in the program that I can't remove or don't know how to remove, right? It's just like, well, if only you made it possible for me to not hear the dog, it would just be better. But now I'm playing this important tournament hearing the dog. You've just you've just made a terrible mistake because now everybody <laughs> watching knows that if they're going to uh, compete and they might get paired up against you to make their pet the dog and just click on it and make it bark the whole time to distract you. It's it's like people used to complain about too much flicking of cards being a distraction. Now we got the dog and barking dog. Yeah, we we need to add that out of the the interview. I can't be exposing my weaknesses. <laughs> Like this. Getting back to the the organized play, you said that you thought that the security and the amount of money that is is being put in to take care of players is one of the the best advantages to these changes. What it, what do you think is just the biggest failing of the current system? If you had to like look focus on one thing that you think is the the biggest mistake going on in terms of organized play right now, what what do you think that would be? I I think the biggest mistake is really the focus on viewership. Uh, mm-hmm. as opposed to everything else, right? For example, you take Limited, right? Limited is is a big part of Magic. A lot of people love Limited. There are very successful podcasts that, uh, you know, that focus only on Limited. There are streamers that streams for right. thousands of people that only play Limited. And Limited is fun. I like playing Limited. Like, I, when I'm going to a constructed tournament, it's like, oh my God, I have to choose a deck. It's so stressful. And Limited is like, yay, I'm going to the pre-release. You know, uh, I, I, I love Limited, and uh, Limited also, I think, sells a lot of packs, right? I, I don't know about how other people behave, but I used, I, I spent a lot of money in my in my Magic years just buying packs to draft, right? Because it was mm-hmm. it was a fun activity, and all the packs that I bought were for drafting. Even then, even right now, before when we test for a tournament, we each buy a box, right? And and yeah. I imagine there are a lot of people like that. A lot of people just like to draft and spend their money in in drafting, and that's obviously good for Watsi. Yet they, they're almost killed limited, right? Because it's not good for the viewers. Yep. So this is this is something that like, yeah, I agree. Limited is not good for the viewers. But at what point are you willing to sacrifice like everything else to get an extra thousand viewers? Right? Because it's not like you're right. going from five thousand viewers to a million viewers. You're not becoming League of Legends. This is not magic strength. Right? You're going from five thousand viewers to six thousand, maybe seven thousand. Right? And it is it worth it? To me, it's not. 
I, I think you should try to make the tournaments as best they, as they can be for people who want to play in them, right? And not necessarily just for the people who are watching. So I, I think, I think and, and for example, the invites, right? They had the discretionary invites and stuff like that. And then it just invited a bunch of players who are not from Magic, right? They invited, say, Savits, right? And, and don't get me wrong. I, I like Savits a lot. I talked to him during the tournament. He's actually a really nice person. But I don't think he should be put in the MPL, right? And then you have all these people who are just trying their hardest and just want to be in the system. And there's no room for them because you're bringing someone from a different game just to get more viewers, right? And I, I wish they wouldn't do that. I wish they, they would, you know, and now that every, everyone is mad about it, right? And, and rightfully so, because if you've been trying for five years and you feel like you finally got there, and you know, oh, there's finally a spot on this thing. Oh, wait, it's this person from, this streamer from a different game that's going to get it. I think right. that feels really bad. Yeah. Right? And so th- that would, I think, is the biggest weakness. is focusing too much on viewership and not enough on magic strength, which is that people love playing it and they want to be part of the system. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, uh, it's very alarming to me to see the de-emphasis on draft. They've even designed new booster packs, uh, these set boosters that are coming out that are are so that you can buy and crack packs that are not meant for draft just straight up buy and crack them i guess to to just get cards you want for standard or such but it's such a de-emphasizing or turning down of the volume on draft which used to be the the lifeblood of magic the gathering it's it's very interesting and again a little scary to see uh i've heard that stores are pre and i know and we're in pandemic right now so of course it's harder for people to go into stores and uh pre-order but i've heard stores are are uh, ordering five to one set boosters versus draft boosters for the fall set and it just sounds like Wizards might take those numbers, combine it with their viewership concerns, and draft is 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 getting pushed to the side, which I, I certainly think is a big mistake. And I'm not even a big drafter, but I, I definitely <laughs> think that's a, that's a that's a huge mistake. Yeah, I mean it's it's the things that set Magic apart, right? I don't think like I don't think other games have that, and Magic does. And instead of just building into it, and they they just. It feels to me like, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side. So they're like, oh, you know, Hearthstone has all these viewers. League of Legends has all these viewers, but they don't have the drafters, right? And, and Magic does. And are, are you willing to sacrifice those for to get some more viewers? Or should you just embrace what Magic is and has been for the past 20 years, right? I, I, my vote is embrace, but again, I'm not, I'm not a businessman. I'm not, a, you know, I don't have insight into the company's finances, so I could just be saying something that makes no sense from, from a company's point of view. But from my point of view, it feels like they should embrace magic strengths. I agree with you 100%. And I, I think that they're they're obsessed with the Hearthstone numbers, the League of Legends numbers. And they're asking, why can't we be getting that? Well, what if we try and make ourselves more like that? And it's coming at a cost of a lot of what has made and defined magic perhaps, but that's me becoming uh, uh, alarmist again. And I don't want to, I don't want to do that. Um, with this shift though, with this shift that we're seeing away from possibly things like draft, there's definitely been a rise in casual magic, the gathering formats like commander are becoming King as it were. Uh, certainly, it's hard to argue that Commander is not becoming one of uh, Magic's big selling points as what the game is. What do you th- make of this? What do you think when you see all the emphasis on Commander and not competitive 1v1 Magic? Do you think it's just a fad? Do you think it's it's the changing face of the game? I don't think it's a fad. I think, uh, you know, I, personally, I don't play Commander. I right. have played before. I have played, like, competitive Commander in the store. You know, 1v1, just everyone trying to win on turn two. <laughs> uh, this kind of thing. But this whole, like, oh, play with eight people, politics, if I attack you, I don't attack. You know, that that's not for me. But I think the beauty of Magic is that you can approach it in many different ways. Right? Uh, and I, I think it is totally valid to just release stuff for the people who want to play Commander. Right? They don't have to cater all the products to the competitive audience or even all the cards in a product to the competitive audience. Right? So if you know there's a standard set and then there's some cards that are not meant for standard and they're meant for commander, and I think that's good. 
right? And and then there's a commander set, and I think that's good too. So I I, I feel like this is a good thing. Mm-hmm. It's you, you again, it's taking magic strength that it can be played in any way that you want and embracing that. Right? It's like, oh, you like playing commander? Okay, we're gonna enable you to do that as much as possible. And I think that's good. The only part that I don't like is when the the more competitive formats get sacrificed for the sake of commander. Uh, for example, Wilderness Reclamation, mm-hmm. right? Wilderness Reclamation, uh, originally, it was a design that said you shouldn't tap, you untap your lands when they untap. But then that was too strong in commander, right? Because you would get eight untaps per turn. Right. Uh, so they just changed it to untap at the end tap, which allowed you to double your mana, right? To, to play a 10-mana you know, card with, with five lands in play, which wasn't possible before. So it's the kind of thing they're like, oh, this card is breaking commander. And instead of like, oh, how can we fix this while not making you break standard, right? Oh, maybe you just target a player. Maybe it enchants a player and then on their turn you untap, right? That would work. Right. Uh, they're just like, yeah, let's make it untap at the end of the turn. And, you know, who cares what, what happens to standard, mm-hmm. right? Uh, I, I feel like in, in that regard, they need to be a little bit more careful. Right when they print cards like you know oh there's there are cards in in the commander set that or the set that is meant for casual that are going to be good in legacy right that's fine but how good are they going to be how accessible are these cards going to be right they printed true name nemesis and then there was a, a legacy tournament the day it was printed and then some people just couldn't get the card right right because who knows where it even is right <laughs> people who who don't play the, these things they're like you just can't buy the product yet but some people have access to it. Uh, so I, I think they need to be a little bit more careful when they do this kind of thing, right? Don't don't forget everything uh, because of Commander, but at the same time, yeah, I think embrace it, right? Just everyone, we're all Magic players, just have products for everyone. I think that's a good thing. Sure, sure. What about the rise of online personalities, uh, YouTubers, streamers, podcasters who are not rooted in the professional side of magic. It used to be when long before I had a YouTube channel that all the articles, all the podcasts, all the information was coming just from the 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 heart of pro play. And while all of those articles and outlets still exist, uh there has been an explosion in creators who are maybe oriented in more casual pursuits or are not interested in pro play or maybe are commenting on pro play but are not themselves professional players and i'm curious what you as a professional magic player make of the rise of some of these i guess magic online personalities i guess such as myself and and many others we could <laughs> list that aren't we don't show up to gps never have never will and yet command a great deal of uh, attention in uh, the magic sphere. Are are we a part of a new world of magic or a part of the problem, perhaps? Oh, certainly not a problem. I think, uh, again, you know, uh, embrace what people want to do. Sure. And I think it's great that there is content for everybody, right? I, I, I produce content a lot. Yes, you do. But I have a specific audience, right? People who want to get better. And not everyone wants to get better and be competitive, and I, there's no reason these people shouldn't have content too, right? So I, I really like that it's now possible to have a more casual audience or, you know, regardless of what you're doing, either you're like, oh, this is for Commander or this I'm reviewing sleeves or this I'm talking about, you know, specifically legacy goblins for whoever likes goblins or this, you know, I'm just talking about limited or I'm talking about, you know, nothing or making a cube, right? right. Cube is one example. There are a lot of people who are focused on cube. And if there is an audience for that, I think you should just embrace it. The one thing that I don't like is that I feel there is an excessive focus on streaming. Mm-hmm. And I feel like this is part of the, you know, oh, we're obsessed with viewership too. Because I feel like Magic has really embraced streaming in in detriment of every other form of content creation. And this really goes about playing to your strengths, right? Magic has a, a vast history of all forms of content creation. Right, I, I, I am a League of Legends enthusiast, right? And then I tried to find articles about League of Legends. I literally couldn't do that. Right. Like I, I asked coaches, they're like, I, I need this resource. Where can I go read about it? And it's impossible. People just don't write reading content for League of Legends. And in Magic, they've been doing it for years. right? And that's a, a big part of Magic's strength because, again, some people like reading. Some people don't like watching. Right. And But if you look at the content creator program, I would not be able to apply for it right. because I don't stream. Right, and you're like, well, I've been writing articles for like 15 years, right? I've written almost a thousand articles. I think other than like Watsi people, like you know Mark Rosewater, 
I might be the most prolific magic writer, right? And and I, I've had a podcast and I have done videos and and all kind of stuff. And yet I, I'm not a content creator. Yep. Right. That that's absurd. And how about the people who you know, such as yourself, you wouldn't be able to apply either. No, I don't stream. They don't right? want. They don't want me. <laughs> I. They don't want me. So I. I Even though. You, yeah. You might be the most popular content creator in Magic right now, right? It, you're certainly up there. And and people who you know do altars and cosplaying and stuff. Th- these people are all a big part of the Magic community, and they're all creators. And I feel like what's the kind of tunnel down streamers? You know, like yeah, these are the people we want to support. Right. Because if if you look at, uh, you know, even the the special invites, right? They they invited people for for these tournaments. They invited a lot of streamers, but they didn't invite a lot of writers. No, they didn't invite a lot of you know cosplayers or anything. Just streamers. I think a lot of. I mean, the, here's where we can get that that graphic of the two hands clasping. And and uh, as a content creator, boy, do I agree with that because they are, are ignored. Everybody, all of my friends who do podcasts and write articles and cosplay and all of this stuff, all my colleagues. Uh, if you're not a streamer, they're not interested in you. And there's so much value to be had across the board through that diversity of of creation, of that diversity of what format, whether it's draft or cube or commander that you want to write about, talk about, create videos about, and yeah, stream about. Uh, but yeah, that definitely seems to be their emphasis is on streaming. I, I wonder if that's going to change. I mean, they didn't get the numbers, did they? They 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 bought a lot of views, but they didn't actually get the organic numbers ever with it. And so it didn't seem to, to pay off in that regard. Yeah, I, it, I, I don't think it did. At least I don't think it, it met the numbers that they were hoping for. Uh, but ultimately, again, I don't, I, I just don't think that should have been their goal from the start. So if you were put in charge then of, uh, setting those goals, let's say that I somehow magically put you in charge as the unquestioned authority of, uh, magic's organized play system of, of, of what they want to do and accomplish and how they want to structure pro play, you have unquestioned authority and an you know, a reasonable enough budget to do what you want. What's the first couple of things you would do with this this power to uh, uh, change those priorities or change that system? I think it really just comes down to embracing the things that set Magic apart rather than trying to be like everyone else, right? Uh, it, everything that I would do would be around that. It would be like, oh, maybe we should get some more Limited back because people like playing Limited and it's good for us if they play Limited. Mm-hmm. Maybe we should incentivize, you know, cosplayers and writers and podcasters and YouTubers a little bit more because we, we have this thing that sets Magic apart, right? Right? Like, Magic is 20 years old, like, 25, 28. Uh, you know, how, how many of these games are this old? Yeah. It's very rare. So I'm not saying, like, ignore coverage. I'm not saying, you know, oh, don't focus on viewership at all. But just, I wouldn't focus on it above everything else. I would, I would, I think Magic is a game to be enjoyed, not to be viewed from afar. So if people are looking at the game, but they don't think they can ever get that, they don't relate in a personal way, it's not going to work. Yeah. Right? It, it only works if people see themselves as being able to experience these things. It's different than other games. Right, some some games, you know. Again, me, League of Legends. I could never play a game of League of Legends in my life again. I just enjoy watching. Right. I don't think Magic is like that. I think Magic, Magic is for the players, and there's so many of them, and they're so different that I would just try to embrace that as much as I could. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, uh, Paulo, if people want to find more from you. I'm going to put links in this video's description, but why don't you tell us where, if people want to find your content or or uh, the work that you do to help them get better and help them on their journey, uh, where can you be found? So you can find me on Twitter. I'm PVDDR on Twitter. You can just message me. Uh, I'm pretty accessible there. Uh, and I also write every week for Star City Games. So it's starcitygames.com. I have a weekly column there. Yeah, these are the two main main ways you can find me. But sometimes you'll find me lurking on Reddit too. I, I reply on, you know, there's this Spikes uh, Reddit group, which is for more serious players. So if you're like, you're already in the MTG Reddit and then you want to get a little bit more serious about the things, you can join the MTG Spikes Reddit. Yeah. Uh, which is, I think, a, a good resource. So yeah, mostly the places where I can Fantastic. I can 
And I'll have links to all of that uh, in this video's description. So be sure to check it out. What an amazing resource uh, for our viewers to have. Yeah, and I think if you want to be a part of Magic's competitive system, you, you, you should go for it. Uh, even though it is a bit harder now, I think it, it is going to get easier. And especially now with so much online magic, I think anyone can succeed, right? If you have dedication, uh, if you have the time, if you have the resources, but especially if you just really want to do it, it is possible. It, it's not easy, but it's possible. Do you think I could succeed at professional magic? No, no, not, not at all. If you hold up seven mana and a player is playing blue, what do you suspect? Seven mana and on blue, you're going to absolutely get Cyclonic Rifted until they eventually ban it. Not not when you're playing against Ken. Because, like, I don't, sometimes I just hold it up just because, just to scare you. And I'll be like, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Put down something. And then as soon as it get back to me, yeah, I don't have nothing. I'm just playing around with you. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, one thing I noticed specifically about Numot, I'm not scared of Cyclonic Rift when seven mana is up. He has Angel of the Dire Hour. This is a seven mana, five and two white uh, flash. When it enters the battlefield, exile all target attacking creatures. Got to conceal those intentions, baby. 